Um, the idea of a space settlement laboratory is basically moving past the idea of what, what I'm seeing with the way NASA has been doing things is that you have the International Space Station, which does good science, but it does it at a very, very high price. We have the asteroid redirect mission, which could do something good for space settlement, but it's doing the least amount of science for the maximum possible expense. And the idea with this is, what if it was essentially privatized? What if we had something that was much more efficient to the whole thing? And what if it was very, very strictly focused on humans to deep space and to settlement? So this chart is basically something I came up with a few years ago. These are the grand challenges of space settlement and exploration. We need affordable launch, large launch vehicles, mass fraction beyond Earth orbit, which is basically half of what you send, what you can send into orbit is, is what you can get beyond Earth orbit. A quarter of that is what you can get to the surface of Mars. Uh, space junk and low Earth orbit, microgravity health issues, I'm just going to lump that together. Um, solar flares, once we get into deep space, uh, uh, galactic cosmic rays, cell damage, medication and food expiration dates, they, they last a lot shorter times on, on orbit. Um, closed loop life support, medical entropy, in other words, what do you do when you need a doctor? Uh, psychology, mechanical entropy, what do you do when you need a mechanic when things break down and if there's, there's entropy you know, scales for these sorts of things. Um, landing on the moon and Mars, Mars entry, descent, landing, spacesuit lifespan. We've never made a spacesuit that lasted on the moon more than three days. So how do you do it for Mars? How do you do it for, for the moon again? Uh, reliable ascent vehicle, we could probably handle that, things like that, Earth reentry. And then uh, for settlement, how do you make air and water, fuel, all that sort of thing. So what we have here, and unfortunately these colors aren't very well distinguished on this projector, these are things we can solve on Earth in labs or whatever. We're apparently very close to getting this large launch vehicle thing settled. Um, these are things that we can do in low Earth orbit. We can do some of these in low Earth orbit. But the issue with these in low Earth orbit is you're not, you still have the Earth blocking 45% of your radiation. So it's not a true model of what's going on in deep space. And you also have the Earth's magnetic field blocking between 5 and 25%, depending on how close you are to the poles of galactic cosmic rays. So you really need something out beyond. Um, so what the, and then these are things that can only be solved at the moon and Mars. You can't really do these in a lab so much. So the purpose of the space settlement laboratory here is to solve these in the short term and solve these in the long term and do it as close to Earth as possible so you're close to your industrial base. So the idea here is something vaguely similar to asteroid redirect. It could be at L5, it could be in high lunar orbit, whatever. But the idea is you, instead of sending one $2.5 billion you know, vehicle out to grab a rock from an asteroid, what if you had a private fleet of things that could grab dozens over time? Um, you bring them in here to do a microgravity assessment. We do our initial science and then start going into the manufacturing arm. We can simulate lunar, this, this spins at two RPM. So this first laboratory over here, we are simulating um, the lunar gravity and how you would build things on the surface of the moon. At this level, we have Mars gravity. If we double the length of this, we go out to Earth gravity and we can simulate a full-blown space settlement in deep space. And then, so once we've done our manufacturing experiments over here, we have our finished goods or whatever. We can ship those back over. This is the life sciences arm. And this is where we would figure out, um, okay, what plants can we grow at what, what gravity levels? What animals can thrive at these things? What are the long-term health effects of things? How um, um, big I would have, unfortunately, they mirror the slides, so all my notes are gone. I'd have to escape out of this. So if I go down about, now I can give you the, I can actually give you the numbers here. There we go. Now it's, it's 45, the lunar zone is 45 meters out. And the, um, this is 85 meters up from the center. So, yeah, it's annoying because they, they just mirror the slides here. Okay. So short answer, you know, rocks go here, manufacturing goes this way, finished goods go this way to the, to the life sciences end. Um, this was my original design for a deep space uh, or lunar or er, earth orbit refueling vehicle that would actually use uh, reinforced ice called pyrocrete because one of the things you don't want in low Earth orbit with a lot of space debris is fuel tanks. 
It's like basically driving a propane tank through a shooting range. It's a really bad idea, except the propellant is uh, much more explosive and the bullets are moving much faster. Um, so the idea here was if you reinforce dice, it's actually stronger than concrete. And if you have 3.5 meters of something stronger than concrete, you're a lot more likely to survive an impact. So from this, I came up with this hexagonal architecture about 2014. And uh, now we've moved on to a, so this became this Lego architecture about three years ago. We have a hybrid thing, which is water around a fuel tank or a large tank or a water ice module or a crew and equipment module, solar panel. And basically you click these things together like Legos and you know, if you know what your power requirements are and anything, you just match the numbers and theoretically it would work. And because you're using economies of scale of manufacturing, you don't have the high price of custom goods for, for space settlement. You, you have a much broader economic model for reducing the manufacturing cost. So if you want to get, for the life sciences side, if you have these around, you've got 3.5 meters of water ice around the entire habitat plus fuel. Uh, so this, is, this seems pretty hardcore. That's probably the equivalent to high altitude flying on Earth. If you actually wanted to go all the way to sea level, you could put three of these modules out, and that's actually almost 40 feet of, of solid water, which is one atmosphere in terms of under the, under the ocean. Um, so you can go full core on this, or you can go much lighter. And for this, this would be, OK, I want to simulate what's it like if I do something in a, in a transit vehicle that I don't need that much protection. Uh, well, but if I'm doing a full scale sediment like on the surface, I want something where I'm going to want to live there 10, 20, 50 years. Um, these are the scales for the revised architecture. I made the walls thicker. Uh, these are relatively <coughs> soft walls here, like a transhab, except slightly thicker. And then we've got a framework around it. Um, and then I wanted to have the symmetries work both directions. So this is a lateral symmetry that is compatible with the, with the uh, mm -hmm. longitudinal symmetry. And the other thing I wanted to do was make them stackable. So we have the open version, but we also have a sort of a, yeah, a, a stacked cup version. Um, so this is 10.3 meters by, uh, let's see, almost three meters wide. So, and this internal volume is almost exactly 100, meter, 100 cubic meters. So the core cross section, this is about 24 meters wide. Uh, you could, if you want this visually in your mind, you could just about park a semi in here, um, but just barely. It would just barely fit down the, down the length of it. It's slightly uh, wider, but it's also slightly taller. So basically, that would, it would be about that big. And then this is where the arms would come in. This is where you'd bring in your stuff. And then um, in terms of structure, if we're talking about just the framework uh, broken down on an economy of scale for cranking out hundreds or thousands of these, plus uh, the price of launching it on a Falcon Heavy times two because we're getting it into deep space. Um, these are some rough price estimates which compare rather favorably at 3.85 billion for just one layer of this, um, plus some of the solar stuff. Um, that's, we've already spent 14 billion on uh, SLS and that's as of last year. That's not to launch. Um, so that gives you an idea of the scales involved. Um, one of the things we could do is we, instead of just having these frameworks for elevators or whatever, we can actually expand it as a solid structure along this axis. We can expand along the radius so that this is a much larger laboratory at this radius. And then we can go longitudinally down the length of it. So we have three different uh, axes of expansion to build a larger and larger facility. And like I said, if you want to build, you know, an O'Neill colony of light, you could actually go out to about here on both sides, have three layers of ice on the outside, go all the way around, you have a space colony. And you have a starting point for a space colony. You don't have the big question mark between the first pages of you know, colonies in space with the space shuttle, and then five pages in, here's the O'Neill colony. And it's like, that's great. How do we get there? No idea. This is part of the reason I got started doing this sort of thing. Um, you would have this whole thing face the sun, much like an O'Neill colony. You'd have extensive solar collection for photovoltaic light collection. In other words, basically big things running things down to fiber optics. And then heat exchangers. Beyond that, because that's your hot end, that's probably where you do a lot of your foundry work uh, with the materials coming in from, from the asteroids. And then on your way back, you'd have you know, warm storage, cooler storage, and so on. And then you start getting back to your spinning, spinning modules. Um, we're back to the whole idea of bits and atoms again. 
you want to extract as much data out of your asteroids before you start tearing them apart. So you would do things like you know, non-invasive uh, core samples like an MRI or, or whatever to look for any structures within the rock. And they're small enough, you can actually scan the whole thing. Um, radar, x-ray, whatever. Um, beyond that, then you would get down to isolate anything unusual. Is there a density change? Is there a gem? Is there, you know, whatever. If there's anything in there that is not part of the overall structure, uh, anything exceptional, grab it, pull it out, put it in a, in a bag somewhere. And then if there's something that's completely mundane, you want a good characteristic of that, grab that, bag it up. It's a little like the principle that architect, or I'm sorry, archaeologists <coughs> use, where they leave, they'll find a, you know, a, a ruined city, and they'll leave like a third of it buried for future ar archaeologists. You know, you'd leave some of this in bags for future examination. And then, as you work your way down, once you start actually tearing this thing apart and doing the ex exploitation of the resources, the fact that you're tearing it apart to take the resources out, if there's 20 liters of water in this volume of rock, the fact that there's 20 liters of water in that volume of rock is itself a data point. So we extract all the data out of it we possibly can all the way through the process so that we're not leaving the science behind. So we do our remote science, our sampling, our precision orbital data to see where it was orbiting at the time. We do our internal scanning and deep core sampling and so forth. Then we run all of these spectroscopy exams and so forth as we're doing the mining itself. When we get into the fabrication, we would boil off our volatiles. This is slightly wrong. Uh, we would boil off our volatiles. We would start doing, we'd pull out the metals, do additive, subtractive manufacturing, layer coating, you know, spray coating like a powder coat. And then anything that's left, you know, carbon, whatever, we would look into soil, solar panels, ceramics, and so forth. The beauty of this is because the lab is constantly expanding, if there's a capability you don't have now, just use it for storage. Eventually, when you have a capability to break that material down, you have a feedstock. The minute you get that new lab up there to say, hey, I've got all this you know, silicon sitting here. What am I going to do with it? Somebody has made a contract and been able to put something out there for you. So the economics of this, the beauty of this is that if we're doing this, you know, you have the, we're, we're kind of back to the original idea of, of if you're doing stuff on Earth, you have all this wonderful technology. If you're doing stuff on Mars, you're kind of doing it by the seat of the pads with whatever you can bring with you. And you've got about a two-year span between being able to send new parts out. If you're doing this in high lunar orbit, you've got a three-day window. So you know, in, in computers and things like that, we have iterations. We have, OK, we're going to do this new software release this year, or we have this scrum cycle this day, or whatever. The tighter you can make those iterations, the faster you can innovate. So by having a three-day iteration of a logistics window instead of a two-year window, by doing this stuff at the settlement laboratory, you can take the aspects of deep space exploration in the near term and settlement in the long term and dramatically reduce the amount of time required to figure out the problems with that. And then the other beauty of this is because you have a range, you can take the same piece of equipment from a microgravity experiment to a lunar gravity experiment to a Mars gravity to an Earth gravity. And if you wanted to simulate you know, Proxima Centauri B, you can put another layer just beyond that and see if it works there. You can simulate exoplanets. You can explain, you know, OK, we're going to do something on Venus. Let's go put a layer just, just inside the Earth one. And you can simulate anything in one lab. You've taken the same piece of equipment and tested it in every environment. So you build a range. You build a box around that piece of equipment. You can decide then, OK, what can I do to expand the capability of that piece of equipment within that box or the range of that box so that it works in more in markets, more environments? Similarly, on the life sciences end, is there a range where, say, honeybees are no longer effective as flyers to be pollinators? Or is there a range where fish don't float in tanks as well and they don't like it? Or is there a range where you know, rabbits need to regularly exercise, otherwise they're not going to have proper bone structure. If rabbits work just fine on the moon, then great. If rabbits do not work so just fine on the moon, why send them to the moon? Why not find out where their operating range is? The third aspect of that is, OK, we've got to build a cycler, or we're going to build a, a space colony, or whatever. We know what plants, what animals, and what equipment, and what humans, for that matter, because we're testing ourselves at the same time. What are our radiation limits? How much cosmic ray shielding do we need? We can quantify all these things scientifically and do proper engineering tests as close to Earth as possible, but not too close, that we're interfering with the experiment by being in low orbit. 
We're also not building a big laboratory and a shooting gallery like we just did. So what we'd eventually like to do is go from a space settlement laboratory to a space fabricated facility. In other words, as you're building that thing in new slices on the back end, you're going to be using more materials that were manufactured in space and fewer that were manufactured on Earth. Eventually, you're going to get to a crossover where, yeah, you're still bringing in computing hardware from Earth and so forth, but you're starting to build the overall structures. The vast majority of the bulk of this thing is built on site. You could then build something like a cycler, a deep space settlement, uh, or asteroid mining equipment that would actually go out to large asteroids rather than bringing little ones back and arrange that sort of uh, economy around the idea that we've built these things from space materials. We've, we've basically solved the problem of uh, the L5 society because they didn't really have that closure between those two aspects. And then the other thing is because we are simulating, you know, what's to prevent a Mars colonial transport from bringing about 20 tons of dirt and putting in just enough water to simulate a Mars atmosphere, you know, cosmic rail shielding and so forth, you can make a full-blown lunar surface or, or lunar surface would be extremely easy, but uh, Mars surface simulator where you could test equipment as if it was on the surface of Mars uh, within this or the habitats, you know, basically put a habitat within a habitat. And then as I said, we have the, the life sciences of how much cosmic ray shielding, how much gravity, what are the ranges that we need for different plants and animals. And this never ends because there's always more species to take up there. You know, if it's big enough, we could take elephants, we could take elephants. But in, in the near term, it's just a matter of what do you really need for an ecology. And then, as I said, this is not, you know, this is not a substitute for actual settlement work. You still have to go to Mars. You still, this is not, you know, I don't want this to turn into like the space station where we spend 30 years floating in orbit and doing nothing beyond that. The idea here is that you are able to, you can, this does not re work really well in isolation because um, you still need this at the moon and Mars of, to bridge this capability section and this capability section. So you still have to do things on the surface of Mars, still do stuff on the surface of the moon with humans as explorers and as inertial settlers. You're just making this process, this process is making this much more financially efficient and it's also giving you the ability to go into this process much more efficiently because you don't have to have those two-year flight windows to here to get to this stage. And everybody's taking pictures of this wonderful slide from two years ago. <laughs> well, there's a whole talk about this two years ago, so just go back on YouTube. Right, I'll pay you a copyright So I think that's about it. Um, yeah, any questions on that? Maybe I should just leave the back slide up. So any questions on this? Yeah, I've got, that's the thing. I said I, I switched to decaf because I needed to slow down. <laughs> uh, you mentioned taking the leftover stuff. Is that going to become a problem eventually? Or are you just going to release it and throw it around the... Well, I mean... It's not 100% usage of it. Well, that's the thing is you're going, it's, you're, you're kind of peeling the onion of initially you're going to boil off the volatiles. Then you're going to go through the next layer, the next layer of, of well, here's material that we don't need. Um, when the guy talked yesterday about the um, asteroid redirect mission, he said, I wa eventually want to get it down to a baseball, and then I want to put that baseball in a museum, or basketball, yeah. and say, this is all that's left of that rock, because we were able to yeah. use everything else. I think if you're using them for shielding, I mean, that's, that's the thing. Bulk yeah. stuff is always shielding. And the other thing is, this is a um, spinning platform. I need counterweights. So they still have, you know, gravity still applies, even if it doesn't do anything else. What's the buffer on uh, altitude and weight? Like, if you are breaking all these down, is there a, a limit to how much you can bring back and start processing, or is there a limit to how long it can stay before you start degrading your orbit? Well, this would be either high lunar retrograde orbit, which is stable for about 300 years, or I would prefer maybe an L, maybe an L2 in the short term, and then maybe an L5 in the long term. Because if you are making all these volatiles, then you have propellant. If you have propellant, you can move on. Um, I guess what's the target weight then to bring back and start processing? Maybe 30 tons, 2 tons, 80 pounds? When you say bring back, what do you mean? It's I all mean there. The From the asteroid belt? 
it's really just a matter of um, it's what you can do. Um, so if you can only bring back 10 tons, then you can bring back 10 tons. If you move on to 100 tons, as long as you have the capacity there, that's the beauty of this thing starting small. I mean, each of these things is only the size of a semi, so, uh, and a short one at that. So you're not going to have much capability starting out. But as you gain capability of you know, planetary resources or whatever going out and grabbing rocks, you have the capacity. You would you'd scale the two efforts to match each other. Um, if I could address that, the big um, restriction is fuel in the delta V. If, if the asteroid has, it, is in an orbit such that you have very little delta V to come back in the way of And you also want to decide you want to bag the asteroid or, or, or hang on to it. I guess what I'm asking is what, what altitude would you put that as a processing point? Like, would there be a limit to how much you could process depending on the size of the um, uh, facility, I guess. Really the, the core initially is about 25 meters, but it's expandable and you can knock the walls out on the inside once you get out. But, so. You have to change your orbit, I guess is my big question about all that. If you change the size of the, of the facility, you have to change your orbit. Um, well, if, there, if the both items are in the same orbit at the same time, then you don't really have the mass issue. You basically... I, I believe if the me if the mechanics are correct, you just orbit faster. Okay. Thank um, you. you just don't move around that much. So, okay. Bruce, did you have a question? Because you raised your um, hand. Yeah, I have a, a bunch of comments. Would you go to where you show that the arm sticking out? Yeah. You know, you like that. Yeah, essentially. I mean, the, what I what I was trying to basically say is, if when it comes to the uh, structure here, here, this is really the box that it goes in. Um, the actual form within that box is basically up to the designer. So it could be an open space unit. It could be pressurized, whatever. But this is like you know an intermodal shipping container is a great example because these four pins go in these four locations. They have this strength. These are the parameters. Anything that fits in those parameters can be shipped intermodally around the world. Well, 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 well for, the, for the sections that make up the arm, you need mm -hmm. a lot of tensile strength. Mm -hmm. So you, do you want these going this way as opposed to longitudinally? Um, which way is it rotating? Either, well, either way. Um, um, okay, if it's rotating the way the arrows go, then the one under gravity want to turn 90 degrees. Now, now that's, that's a fairly minor detail. Um, I guess the question is, are you spinning it like this, or are you spinning it? Because the reason I'm spinning it with the end pointing toward the end is that when you're into the low, this is, this is the fun thing about this. Just right around this zone is when you can start getting into vertigo issues with spinning. It's just, in fact, it, we're kind of pushing it with two RPM. You may actually have to slow this thing down and move things out to get them out of that zone. So, but this is kind of right at the ragged edge of that. And part of the reason I was going this way is, one, you've got the expansion issue. The other is that if I walk across the room, I don't have the issue of if I walk this way, I'm under higher gravity than if I move this way. Um, uh, um, okay, another, another comment is the ones under gravity. Um, I, um, I know if people are walking around in them, you have an internal cylinder of pressure. Mm -hmm. But if you ever have a robot walking around in an unpressurized planet, and so, um, you show V shaped floors and mm -hmm. you just turn them. Yeah, that's, well, this is just one, this is just the structural thing. This is, yeah, you would, exactly that. This is, this is actually a crude version of the geometry. I actually, one of the things I, I, I might as well bring it up because I have time. I, there's 
a chart in my mind of what I talk about and what I don't talk about at these things. There's this middle that is things that have, are actually of value. There's kind of the scale of time of this is things that are of immediate value and these are things that won't be valuable for another 100 years. And then there's the actual value itself. And so this big pool in the middle is stuff that's like worth patenting and copywriting and stuff like that. The stuff out here like this that's out of, you know, if I patented this tomorrow, it's not going to make any difference. It's like, uh, yeah. So what I, what I talk about here in terms of the actual geometry, because that is like three versions behind what I'm really thinking. So I put up hexagons because it's just easy to draw that way. But it's, it, the structure in my head is actually much more advanced than that. Yes? In your initial operating capability, how many people in the Um, hard to say. I think we would try and automate it as much as possible because it may be you intended initially. Um, and there's really, until you bring in um, a few rocks, there's not much to do. So, um, but once you start doing the, auto, you know, it's, it's, that's a very fluid question because uh, automation technology is going to change a lot between now and when something like this can be launched. Man, it's going to be, it's, we would want it to be more, the space station is probably a bad model because a lot of that engineering in there was, was uh, very conservatively done and therefore rather high maintenance in terms of the human factor. Um, it was not built with automation in mind when it was designed and a lot of the things were designed back in the era of Pentium 1. So if you think of it more from a commercial attribute, you'd probably have better technology around that sort of thing. Yes? Do you see any special need for an open, I hate to use the word, an open vacuum laboratory on the surface? I mean, um, Within this? Outside of that. Um, yeah, but the other, the other attribute of that is, like I said, that frame is just a frame. Um, you could just take the walls out and call it open. And in fact, that on the, on the uh, hot end, as I say it, which I didn't draw here because there wasn't time, but the place where you're doing all your solar collection, that's open frame. It's all vacuum rated except for wherever you're bringing in, you know, pressure and things like that. Uh, to address that, yes, you could have one of these as a frame with a floor. So you could use it for storage, you could use it for building testing. Anything, mm -hmm. anything to build the moon, test the moon, could test on this platform. Yeah, there's almost nothing to it for the moon because it's vacuum and all you'd really need is a water bottom to simulate the fact that you've got a planet of ra radiation protection. No, what I'm saying is have one of your hexagonal modules that's mm -hmm. an open floor, like you suggested, mm -hmm. open frame, and then you could have one of these as a floor. Yeah. And it, let's say there's a piece of equipment you're going to send to the moon from Earth, so you could send it from the Earth to here, you're yeah. testing the moon your gravity in a vacuum, and then send it on the moon. Well, well then you can take it to the Mars lab and test it, it in Mars conditions, Mars, and then send it. Or anything in between. Yeah. You want to do Mercury? You can do Mercury is only one percent different than Mars gravity, yeah. even though it's smaller than Ganymede because it's so dense. Okay, I think we're yeah we're officially out of time.